Been traveling around Thailand, all this like crowd of people around this stand, realized it was this new way of making ice cream. And when, why isn't this in the UK? Dropped out of university the next day. I was like, I'm not coming back. Henry Milroy, he started Pan Ice, which is a really innovative ice cream concept. Being naive and not really knowing what you're getting yourself into is actually really good when starting your business. You're gonna make mistakes, but it's those mistakes that are gonna make us grow. Yeah. Knowing what you know now. Yeah. Right decision. So guys, I'm really excited to have on today's episode, Henry Milroy. He started Pan Ice, which is a really innovative ice cream concept that I first saw walking through White City. But I was in the gym this week, having a little gym session, and I heard a discussion of ice cream going on. I thought ice cream is a bit of me. So I introduced myself and said he should get on a podcast with us here, talk about how he started this business. But thanks for coming on, mate. No worries, man. Thanks for having me. So where does your entrepreneurial journey start? Were you, uh, you know, one of these kids selling sweets or where does it begin? So I suppose my entrepreneurial journey started. I was, um, I think the first thing I can remember, I, when I used to be at college, I used to run a lot of the nights. I used to, I grew up in a place called Reading. Yeah. There used to be loads of like club nights there. And I randomly got myself involved in like the promotional side of these nights. Um, it started off, used to be flyering, you know, on the streets, handing out flyers for the clubs. And then quite quickly I kind of, went up the ranks, I suppose, in the company and started running my own nights there. And that's when I think I first got a sense of like doing something for myself because I literally had the nights I could be, I could do whatever I want with them. And that's kind of where I really got the fire for like doing my own thing. And I like, also seeing the money, it's probably the easiest money I ever made in my life. Um, really? Yeah, it was just crazy just at talk, such a young age. So yeah, that I kind can of imagine. got the fire going in me. No, that's quite cool. And what what sort of, um, what did you do from then on? Because obviously Pan Ice, yeah. How, how long is the gap till Pan Ice is your first business, I guess? Yeah, yeah, Pan Ice is my first business. So then I went to Birmingham University um, mm -hmm. to do mechanical engineering um, with the idea that I'd eventually work in like Formula One. That's my. Oh, really? So I, I love everything to do with like motor racing, a bit like you, like yeah. engines. I love the practical side of engineering. I went to university there and quickly realized doing mechanical engineering is not practical it's well especially in the first couple of years it's all like theory and all maths basically right okay so quite quickly was like mm, this isn't really for me um and then it was at the end of the second year me and my mate um we went traveling around thailand well, i say traveling it was literally a two-week holiday yeah so we went to co pp um and it was literally on one drunken night we were just stumbling along one of these streets <laughs> we saw this like crowd of people around this stand went up to it and was like what well, you know what's going on here um, first we thought it was like crepes or something. We didn't understand what it was. And yeah. then we quickly realized it was this new way of making ice cream. And like, this was back in 2015. So like no one had seen this before. And it, we literally looked at each other and went, why isn't this in the UK? Um, and that's pretty much it. That's where it started. Really? I, I honestly dropped out of university the next day. I sent my no tutor an email. I was like, I'm not coming back. I think I was going <laughs> to drop out anyway. Yeah. Okay. So like, I wasn't, I just, I loved university at like, the social side, like, just the experience by the the like the maths exams every week, the theory side. Like I just I was getting so bored, and it was at that stage as well. I started reading like different books, watching podcasts, and being like on entrepreneurialism. And, yeah. Um. I knew that. Yeah. This was like the idea of Panonize came at the perfect time. Straight away. Sometimes like, is that even... right time, right place yeah. thing, though, isn't it? I think exactly. the same with X. Like with me, I was it was during I just finished university. I was really into racing. And it was, I was into health and fitness as well. Mm. And it just sort of came to me as I was drinking sort of outdated energy drinks. I was mm. like, oh, I wonder if they could be a healthy one. And it tied in with racing and everything. But on the, the pan of icing, what give you the conviction to to send that email to say, right, I'm leaving? Because that's not easy. Yeah. Did you have I, like I mean, it, an idea it was going to work? Or <laughs> I mean, no. I mean, I think, as you know, being naive is the biggest strength when starting a business. Otherwise, no one would ever, no, I, well, I definitely wouldn't have started Pan and Ice if I knew everything I was going to about to go through. Um, but it was, it was, for me, it was actually quite easy, as I said, because I knew university was not right for me. And it was within those few months before finding Pan and Ice, I was reading a lot of books, looking, watching podcasts, and I knew there was like, this wasn't right. I need to get out there and do my own thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was it was for me it was it was an easy decision. I was really excited about it. I didn't even like consult any of my parents or anything. It was like straight away, boom. And then when I came back from Thailand, I told them. Um, to be fair to them, they took it quite well. I think they knew as well. Yeah, you just wasn't. You know, I've got ADHD. It. I'm always, I can't focus on one thing for too long. So they knew. That, yeah, that's probably the right decision. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, then 
came back from Thailand very quickly, kind of got going. I mean, we'll get into the, the business itself, but sort of for people in that position, mm. sort of in university, maybe not enjoying it, don't think the course is right for them. Yeah. Knowing what you know now. Yeah. Right decision? Or should you have seen your course? What would you advise to people in that? I, I know mean, it's different for everyone. Yeah, but. it changes obviously depending on what you want to do. Like if you're really obsessed with becoming like specific, you know, type of person, like if you want to be a doctor, if you want to be, <clears throat> I don't know, something like that, like that actually probably does require a degree. But a lot of the time people just don't know what they want to do. So they go to university as it's like the normal thing to do and the parents tell them that's what you've got to do. But they actually don't realise that you don't need to go to university. Like... I would have 100% not even gone to university if I knew what I know now. Yeah. Um, I just, I honestly see university as two wasted years. Not wasted fully because I enjoyed the social side of it, but like I could have been so much further on in my life right now if I didn't go to university and all the debt. Um, I think the world's starting to realise that university isn't everything. So, yeah. Yeah, and no, I'd agree. And I think it's changing quick and then, like mm. with ChatGPT, you start playing yeah. on these things. What, what like, It's hard to know what even careers there will be necessarily exactly. in five years. We're going to be doing different things, aren't we? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can pretty much get AI to probably do your whole degree quite soon. So Yeah, scary. I know yeah. it would have been doing mine if it was there. <laughs> yeah. 100%. 100%. 100%. So sort of going forward then, you've got this idea. You're like, right, I'm going to leave university. Mm. What then do you do? Because they're obviously making this in Thailand. How, yeah. how do you find, I guess you've got to figure out how they're doing it and then how do you sell it and make it and what's the cost, I guess? Yeah, tell, that's tell it. So that. we had about, I think we had like a few days left of our holiday in Thailand at the time we found found this idea. Um, so we instantly said to each other, right, we're going to do it in the UK. And then the next few days, we literally spent going back to the same stand, taking pictures, <laughs> taking videos, asking the guys behind the stand, like, what's that white, liquid you're pouring on the pan we have no idea what any of this is like what is that metal thing you're making on is it how cold is it we were just trying to get as much data and like information as we could from them um yeah because we, we literally had no idea we were trying to ask them where the machines made <laughs> did they cotton on to what yeah, you were trying to do yeah 100 did like because we were literally <laughs> coming back all the time like yeah. multiple times a day i'd be going back there and taking pictures like, i've still got all the videos and pictures on my phone now it's so funny um Anyway, we then, so, so that was it. So we spent the rest of the trip in Thailand kind of like finding out as much information as we could. We also contacted a friend of ours who was a graphic designer um, to start briefing him on a logo creation. Like we, we the net, also the name, the name was, the name came, I basically, before I went to Thailand, I knew this company called Ice Pan that was in America. Yeah. They don't make the ice cream the same way. It was a frozen pan, but it was like cold stone creamery. They like, have ready-made ice cream, just chuck toppings into it. It was called Ice Pan. I just flipped the name around and just yeah. put Van and I, I didn't think about it much. So that was the name. And then we needed a, lo we needed a logo. Um, and the original ideas were for a logo were so funny. The first one was like a flying cow with like <laughs> milk coming out of it. It was just... With like, send me some like like we'll put a And then like a heli... And like a bloody helicopter thing on its head and stuff. It was just so funny, the original mm. designs. But yeah, that was all kind of, we, by the time we were then flying back from Thailand, we kind of had our first initial logo. And then it was just about kind of, we came back in uh, July. We knew like, if we wanted to get this, we wanted to try to test this business as quickly as possible. So mm. we had like a couple months left of summer. So we literally, I literally went on, um, at the time I didn't know what Alibaba was, but I found Alibaba. And then I spent ages trying to understand what to type into Alibaba to find these machines, bearing in mind there were hardly any on Alibaba because it was such a new business then. But anyway, I found it, like this frozen ice plate. Um, quickly ordered that from China. It cost us, cost us about £2,000, which we just put in ourselves. Um, we brought a gazebo, like a gaze like branded gazebo yeah, with yeah. our pan and ice logo on it and our name and stuff. And then we just tried to, you know, get into any events we could. Um, and the first event we did was called Arlesford County Hall Show or something. It's a tiny event in the countryside. And the machines arrived the day before our first ever event. So we were up all night. We <laughs> Trying to work got, it. Yeah, we, we got them from China. They came from China. We had to go pick them up from the port. And then we were just, we, we spent all night that night learnt, trying to make this <laughs> ice cream. Bear in mind, we had no idea. Like we were literally just up all night playing around with it. And then, yeah, literally went straight to our first ever event. I bet there were some funny flavours coming out yeah. of that. Oh, mate. The original menu was just, like, 
it is so funny how complex how, how complicated we made it. We had like the gazebo, and on one side you had your toppings, and I kid you not, we probably had like a hundred different toppings oh, that you God, could put into yeah. it. And we had like ten different granola flavors and stuff. So weird. And then the other side was that like choose your base, so people had to go to one side. To then go to the other side to, oh, no, to choose their hundred we, toppings. We just, we just didn't have a clue what we were doing. Um, it was just, but yeah, looking back at it now, it's so funny. It's like, that naivety, though. I think, isn't it? Because if you didn't have that, you probably wouldn't have ordered the machine anyway. Yeah, and well, that's just it. Had a go. I, I honestly think being naive and not really knowing what you're getting yourself into is actually really good when starting a business. Because as you know, so many people say, "Oh, I've got a good idea," but they're always trying to perfect it, or they always know what the downsides might be. So then they they just wait until this perfect moment and that never comes. So being naive is actually really good and just kind of jumping into it and being like, right, I'm going to make mistakes, but it's those mistakes that are going to make us grow. Yeah, and just figure out on the way is exactly. almost... It's the same as what we've done with X. I, I, knew, I know now, if I knew what I knew, I would never have started. Yeah. I think that's why a it's lot a of people... Out yeah, there, so. I think that's why a lot of people in the industries they're in always struggle to start businesses because yeah. they probably know too much almost. Yeah, like you can yeah, know yeah. too much sometimes. No, nah, exactly. I, I always do say if I was going to start, like I would never start a business like Panelites again, which is <laughs> physical retail. Like it, it's amazing. I love it, but it is just so hard. I can imagine. Um, so it's, it has like changed my perception of what I want to do in the future after Panelites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just because, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. It's, 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 it's grown me so much as a person though. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't want to. Uh, there's there's loads more out there that I'd prefer to do. Now. I mean, talk me through some of the challenges. I mean, you've got you've just mentioned one, which was one figuring out how to make ice cream on mm. this pan. Mm. You're slowly moving for that. What was the business model? Was it we're just going to get loads of these and go to loads of events and just make a nice income for both of ourselves, or was you thinking right, we're going to get loads of these in shopping malls? Yeah, which you do we, have a few now. What, what was we the were plan? very ambitious from the start, so we knew we wanted to grow it. Like we didn't want to just be a market stall trader. We were both really ambitious. You know, we want, we saw this as becoming a big brand in the ice cream industry. We were we were looking at people like Ben and Jerry's, you know, the big players, and we were like, why can't we be like that? So we always had this vision to be um, a really big player. Um, the plan was, you know, first couple summers, we're going to do as many festivals and events we possibly can, just ourselves yeah. and some mates, um, just to kind of grow the brand, see people's reaction, um, understand, you know, who's our customer. And then, I mean, that was the plan. So we were going to do that for a few years. Um, and then the plan was to go into retail. So like we, we saw, we thought we could get shops everywhere, all, all in the UK, like hundreds of stores. Um, retailers in open up your own shops. little ice cream shops yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. it's like in shopping malls on the side of streets um so that was the plan um which is where i've seen the brand in yeah. white city yeah exactly so we got we got five at, at the moment um we used to have a lot more before covid but closed a few of them just because of covid obviously but yeah that was the plan i think we again we didn't realize just how hard that is like you know when when it's when it's the founders running say the, uh, the festival or something, everything's much easier because you're in control of everything. Mm -hmm. But then when you, tr when you, so your expectation is set there, like your customer service, like we used to high five customers. We it used to be such an experience for the customer that the product was always perfect because we were making it. Yeah. Then when we started to grow, I think a big thing we learned is, which everyone always tells you, like no one cares nearly as much as you do. Like, so when we, you know, even when we started doing more events like festivals, we used to have more than one stand. So we would be at one festival and we'd get another person to another festival. And like, it just suddenly, it really quickly hit us that like, it's so hard to manage people and get them to work the same way as you, get them to care as much as you. And like, the quality would very, very quickly, we see the quality go down. And we were getting so annoyed by it all. We were like, why, is, why aren't you doing it like us? So that, that was a massive learning curve. And that increased massively as we went into retail. Then we had stores. We tried to hire staff for them. That was a like, massive challenge, like understanding, you know, um, how to motivate staff, to, you, know, you know, how to train them properly. Um, that is staff leak come and go. Like just the whole thing around staffing in the retail stores was just a very challenging and it's still challenging today. Yeah. Like making them work the same way as you, giving that customer experience that we're used to doing ourselves, getting the staff to do that is just it's just extremely hard. So that that's that's been the biggest challenge, one hundred percent, just managing the staff. 
I can imagine is a is a service business, like you said, to, yeah. to manage. I mean, it, it makes you realise how good a job places like Starbucks and things yeah, have been to keep incredible. that so consistent across stores. And yeah, they, they have that thing. Well, it's more in America, I've noticed. When you walk in, they're like, "Hey, welcome to Starbucks!" Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but, every Starbucks, but that's incredible. Yeah, like, honestly, when I when I walk, my girlfriend laughs at me all the time because when I walk into anywhere like a McDonald's or a Starbucks or a Pret, I'm literally in awe because I know how hard it is to get to where they are, like to get all the staff like, looking smart, turning up on time, like giving that consistent customer service, the product quality. Like, that is so hard, and to do it on a, to do it on a bigger scale where you've got hundreds of stores, like. Yeah, I just hats off to them because it is it is a real challenge. Um, I think we, I think my uh, my business is naturally a lot harder though because I'm so much more dependent on the staff because obviously all the ice creams are handcrafted. Mm-hmm. There is no machine. Um, each ice pan, which make the ice cream on, requires a staff member to make it, and it takes you know f- three minutes to make that ice cream, including you know the whole customer service piece. So it's it we are an extremely labor intensive business, which is. Make, it does make it more challenging. And obviously scale, some yeah. of the staff are like, they don't, you know, it's hard work, like making ice creams all day. It can be hard work. So I mean, talk me through a bit about the ice cream itself then, because obviously yeah. I've seen it be done, but what are you actually doing? You're pouring... It's just a some... cream. It's like a, it's like a special cream. It's like our own recipe. So it's like a sweetened cream. Yeah. You could pretty much say it's like melting down an ice cream. It's the cream you get from that. And then the I, there's like a metal plate, mm-hmm. which you then... Um, pour this cream onto then you add in your flavors which can be anything so it's all fresh ingredients so if you wanted like a strawberry ice cream you'd add in fresh strawberries or if you wanted like a cheesecake ice cream you'd add in a slice of cheesecake like the possibilities are endless so you put that one on the pan then you've got your uh like wallpaper strippers that's what i've them. seen them and they're like yeah chopping yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so you use them and you like you slice and dice it all up together so it's all combined and you spread it over the plate, and then you like roll, you like scrape it off, and it goes into little rolls. Oh, nice. So it's, 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 and it is really nice because you've got all the fresh ingredients and all the, you know, like when you put an Oreo in, it doesn't go soggy. The texture's still yeah, there. It's all still there, holds. freshly made. Exactly. So it is really nice. It's also a lot better for you than normal ice cream. There's only like 110 mils of cream in there. Oh, okay. um, and it, because when you roll it up, there's those of air gaps. It looks, you know, it fills up a big pot, but it's actually nowhere near as much as you thought. Okay. So it's, um, nice yeah. And we could, we do like vegan flavors. That's the thing. It's such a versatile product. Like, as I said to you the other day, you could literally pour your excite on it and it would literally turn into a sorbet. So it's a really cool, versatile We need to do some events for that. It'd be so cool. 100%. Especially in summer, a festival. <laughs> They'd be loving that. They would. <laughs> Get your energy pick up in an ice cream. That would be cool. I mean, just back to the challenges bit, because I think it's quite interesting. What would you say to, because I think there's lots of founders that are in your position. They've got businesses they've started mm. and they're trying to scale it and they're really struggling with it. Mm especially with service-based businesses, what what did you find helped you personally sort of get through that? Because I can imagine this probably quite stressful trying to manage those teams, think about the business growing, yeah. you're managing costs. Oh, no, it's been, it's, it's been, I mean, pre-COVID, yeah, we've had so many times, we you know, it gets to the end of the month, like, how the hell are we going to pay all these staff? Um, it's always weird, though, no matter how bad it gets, I always know deep down that, I will somehow figure out a way to get through this. Like there's always, there was something that I always figure out a way. Like it's got to the point sometimes where I'm literally like, Oh my God, what am I going to do? I, we have no cash left in the bank. I've got payroll coming up in a few days. I've got a VAT return that I forgot about, but like you've just got to keep going. I know it sounds really cliche, but like you just got to keep going and keep pushing through. Um, and you will get there. I think it was, you know, I don't have a business partner at the moment, um, anymore, but having a business partner in those early days when we were first going through these issues, that was, it was really nice to have someone to like, we were helping each other through those moments. Um, yeah, sort of pick one up. Yeah, because it was all new to us. Like cash flow issues were like the first time we experienced that, we, were, we didn't understand it and it was horrible. And then VAT, like all these, <laughs> all these massive hurdles that get thrown at you, like having someone to go through that with is very good um, because it, it is, it's, as you as you probably know, it's, it's hard. Like it takes out of you completely. Um, but yeah, you just got to keep going. Like I've got a tough personality. Like no matter how bad it gets, I know that I will get through this. Um, and I think as an entrepreneur, you need that. Otherwise, if I didn't have that, I would have probably given up a long time ago. And I think entrepreneurs, they did, I've spoke to a lot on this this podcast, and it's always they always come from this like place of so much passion they almost can't mm. stop if you know what I mean yeah I've probably fell foul of it before when excite's been on its sort of knees and they're like 
most sane people would probably be like, this is it then. Yeah. And then you just keep going for whatever reason. Yeah, you do. Yeah, it's, it's just an obsession. Like, yeah. there is no other way. Like, when like, I've had even people tell me, saying, Henry, I think you should stop now. It's like, that's not, that's not even... It's, that's it's not, not possible. possible. <laughs> yeah, it's not possible. Like, that's literally impossible. Like, of course I'm not going to stop. Um, it's a complete obsession. So, but yeah, you've got to be like that. Um, otherwise, you, you, I would have stopped this after probably six months of doing it. I mean, on on that bit, entrepreneurship's become quite sexy now, I guess, mm. in terms of... But I guess rightly so, because it's easier to start a business now. Mm. You can find so much stuff online. Yeah. You don't need degrees and stuff to figure out how to run a business anymore. What would your advice be to people on the fence? How, how do they know if they've got that passion to do it? Because I think if you didn't, it's yeah. going to be a tough journey. I mean, I think even if you start something and it fails quite quickly, I think that's still a good thing, because I think you would have... L- like I learned more in my first one month of starting Pan and Ice than I did in my whole two years at university and probably college as well. So I think just like not putting too much pressure on yourself, realizing that even if you start something and it fails, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like you're going to take away loads of learnings from that. Either you're going to take away, right, I've learned this, I can put this towards my next business, or entrepreneurship is not for me. Let's go back and like, so that I, I would say just go for it. Um, just like literally go for it. You're as you know, you, you only live once. So you've got to you've got to try these things. Otherwise, you'll be like always thinking, "What if?" Um, so yeah, I, I always say just go for it. Like people always come to me with amazing ideas all the time, and I'm just like, just start. Like just give it a go. Like I'm not saying like give up your day job or whatever. Like that. Just just start putting things together. Like create a name. Start start an Instagram handle. Like get your domain. Like just start little things, and eventually that will snowball. Um, but yeah, I think people are just always so worried about the, oh, what if it fails or is this the right product? Like you don't really know until you start it. And I think it's, you're right in terms of like, unless you start doing those small little things, moving towards something, mm. you don't know if it's going to stick anyway, even in your mind, you yeah. might get pat to the Instagram bit and yeah. be like, do you know what, actually, I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah. But until you do the little tasks, yeah. you don't know almost. Exactly. And also like. Well, how we started panel, we, we we hardly put in any money. I mean, it was only like, it was a, putting about a thousand pounds each at the start. So even if it did fail, it's not the end of the world. It's not like you're putting in, you know, ridiculous amounts of money into the business at the start. You shouldn't, I don't recommend doing that necessarily right at the start. Like be strategic a bit. Like don't, you know, start small, get a minimum viable product, then test that. Um, you know, don't go in and spend, put your house up for mortgage yeah, and stuff. Exactly. Like, you know, I'm not expecting you to do that, but just start small and just learn from it. And then that will then decide what you what, what's best to do. I think people miss that quite a lot sometimes. Is that the, and we're never taught, I guess, on sort of how to actually manage the mm-hmm. downside of a risk profile. Because like mm-hmm. you said, ultimately, you would have lost the cost of your machine just mm-hmm. to start. Yeah. But if you thought much further and was like, right, I'm going to open... 50 stores or well, 50 stores is going to cost me 20 grand a store and yeah, then yeah, yeah. I'm 300k in and then it fails I'm fucked but you wouldn't never yeah. start like that anyway no. would you? you'd, you'd start smaller exactly no I'd, yeah never I would never start like that um I always think you know it's best to start with a minimum viable product you know understand your market who's your customer that's another thing we 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 were so confused by when we started Palanice we thought we could open up a store everywhere basically wherever there's footfall and people walking everyone's going to want a pan and ice. yeah you quickly realise that is not the case at all. Like for Pan and Ice, as an example, we only work in places where people are relaxed. So they're they're in a relaxed environment. They're walking around. They're not on the on the move. Like they're not in a station, for example, on the move from A to B. So because they've got to be willing to wait a few the minutes. Time, yeah. yeah, they've got to be willing to queue. Also, we're very much orientated towards like families, young younger people, um, like kids. Um, so like all of that was just we used to go to all these different events and even try different locations and we were so confused like why isn't this working there's so many people here but like not everyone's going to love your product you like knowing who your customer base is so important um and it's it's the whole thing about like influence as well like people think oh as long as they've got loads of followers that means they're going to do really well for my product that's not true as well either at all like we when we whenever we work with influencers now we much rather work with like a micro influencer who has a really relevant following for our audience, like, for example, like a, a mom or something, a mom with, yeah. you know, 20K followers, rather than someone who's got, like, millions of followers but has, like, an audience that is completely irrelevant, we'll get way more out of that micro-influencer. It's really hard, though, isn't it, to, as a brand owner, I think, sometimes, 
not be vanilla and yeah. just go for everyone. Yeah, it's, it's quite a hard thing for founders to learn, I think. No, and you, yeah, and well, naturally you want to do that because you think there's a bigger prize there. Yeah. Um, you think, oh, well, it's like you said, it's like Ben and Jerry's. It's yeah. for everyone, for, but it's it's not because the way you make it and the way you've got to enjoy yeah. the process. It's it's learning about people and like consumer behaviors. It's, that's like something that's I find so interesting. Yeah. And also my business just isn't, is there's like three elements of it as well. And each of those elements has a whole different customer profile. Like the shop side, as I've just been talking to you about, that's like a family, you know, families come to like Westfields, et cetera. The kids buy an ice cream. So that's for like families and parents. And then the, we've got an event side of the business. Oh, of course. Yeah, that has which to is like events. completely corporate. So like that whole, like distinguishing the brands between those two different markets has been so interesting like if you go on our website now the, the events part of the bit the website is all like black and white because it's all corporate okay. it's completely corporate focused because like that that's who we're going after like working with the big tech companies yeah and obviously our normal branding doesn't work for them yeah and then we've got an e-commerce part of the business selling the kits um obviously they are for kids however the kids are never going to be the ones spending 50 pounds 100 pounds and buying them so it's like really interesting like how to target like learning about your different audiences as for your product and how to target them properly. Where did you learn that sort of skill? That's just from trial and error. Yeah, just trial Literally and error. Literally trial yeah. and error, yeah. Like just A, B testing. Um, it's just happened naturally. It's taking a long time like to really know who our customer is. And it, do, it do, does take a long time because you've got, you, we've tested so many different angles. Eventually, I think we've got quite a good grasp now on who our customer is for yeah. everything. And what's the sort of next stage... For your business next, you've got the five, is it five stores? Yeah, we've got stores? five stores. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, we've got, so for the retail part, we've got the five stores. We're looking to hopefully get a few more of those. And then I really want to work on perfecting those stores, like bringing back that original experience when I used to work in the stores. Like, yeah. you know, because I think that's it's, that's been hard to maintain, as I spoke about earlier. Like the, the, the experience level has gone down a bit. So I want to perfect the experience, perfect the product in those stores, and then look to franchise that business internationally yeah obviously where there's warmer climates um so that's for that business then the events company just looking to scale that massively really go more into like full event management so not just doing desserts and ice creams and bars like we want to do the whole event nice whether it's the entertainment the venue management you know we want to do the whole thing um because we've got the experience now to do that so that's that business and that'll that'll probably become its whole separate own brand um with a whole different name because it's not tied to pad and ice at all because obviously when people think of pad and ice they think of ice cream yeah, we, don't want, we don't want that for the events business because yeah. we want to be able to do the whole thing and then the e-commerce is probably the most exciting part of the business because obviously we've spent eight years building this amazing brand with you know millions of followers across social I can um, imagine it like TikTok yeah. must be so good for you guys like yeah, people making perfect. their own chopping their own ice cream yeah literally stuff must go viral so that's quite. the idea now it's just, it's just we just want to pivot all of that following into our e-commerce business um, and that's going to, you know, we want to start releasing loads of new products. Um, really that made that become like its whole separate entity. It's, I'm really excited for that business. Like we've got a few new products launching literally as I, as we record this now, um, which are going to be dropping on Amazon this week. Oh, nice. So that's, they're like, um, yeah, a new, a new, like some just new ice cream machines with our branding on. This is to make it at home. Yeah, this is to make it at home. So nice. we've got them launching. So yeah, that's I want to. That's the real scalability part of Paradise now. Yeah. So I'm looking to build that out, build out that team. Um, basically, yeah, I, I I can see that that business getting pretty big. Lots going on then. Really. Yeah, it must be busy. Lots going on, mate. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's exciting hectic. though. But I love it. I I mean, I, I don't know about you, but like, if I'm not really busy, I just I just hate it. Oh, I'm the same. I get. I hate it. Some of my team now are like. Why are you still doing so much stuff? Like, yeah. Oh, we'll go on a track day today, then we'll film this tomorrow, and then yeah. we'll do this for the exciting. But it's just what you like, isn't I it? I know, yeah. I, I hate being, like, not really busy, like, manic. And I ha I'm not a very, because um, I've got ADHD, I'm not very good at, like, doing all the boring stuff. I need something really exciting <laughs> to do. I'll stick at it, the exciting thing for, like, maybe, like, two weeks maximum, then I'll need to do something else. Yeah, like, yeah, I can never yeah. stick at something for too long. So it's always, there's always got to be new ideas, which I think is really good. Like, yeah. I think some, you know, I'm at the forefront of the business driving the growth and stuff, so I'm always pushing the team. and the, the, All the team look at me sometimes and go, like, oh, here we go again. Another new thing, like, we're not busy enough. <laughs> no, it's interesting. Thing. And it, I'm very similar to that in terms of, like, I've always got to be busy. Yeah. I put a post up last week and I was like is this just a mechanism of coping for something else, just being busy all yeah. the time? But you mentioned ADHD, and obviously it's getting a lot of 
talk at the moment, yeah. especially it seems quite prevalent in the news and things. I've probably got it by what you just said. Yeah. But what what's your where did your sort of diagnosis come from for that? And what's I've your thoughts it, around ADHD? And because it does seem to be getting not yeah, popular. But yeah, you know I mean, I, mean, I think it's talked about it a lot. I think now. people glamorize it a lot now. I mean, I yeah, I mean, I've had it since I was young. Yeah. Um, and that's why I've always struggled at school. So like, just to keep attentive on things. Yeah, I, mean, I've, I was a nightmare at school college like I'm just like very fidgety like I've never been one who can go to a cinema or watch a movie it just doesn't happen like yeah. not, like you can ask my girlfriend I just can't like sit still so I'm a, if I go to the cinema or something I'm just I just become so annoying so yeah I've just ha I've always been like this person who can't sit still can't relax can't focus on one thing for too long but does um, that help you I guess because then you're hyper focused in other areas yeah so it, it's honestly a, I think it's a blessing like it's it's made me like really always drive for change, um, constantly innovating new ideas, which I think is so important. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, the whole, the whole e-commerce business. So when Pan and, when COVID came, I had the events business and the retail business. COVID came and literally shut them down straight away. And I was like, so quickly, I went into this mode of like, okay, I need to get this business. I need to make this business survive through this. So yeah. I so quickly just developed these pans the DIY kits and wow, launched that wow. business. So that was launched in COVID from that yeah. problem. So I moved back to my parents. I couldn't afford my <clears> flat in London. So I moved back to my parents' house back in um, Henley. Um, and I was just in my bedroom work, working like, like I used to when I was younger. Um, and then I just thought, you know, how can we bring that experience of Pan and Ice into people's homes? Because I knew like e-commerce is going to boom now because everyone's yeah. at home. Um, so I just so quickly got on the phone to the manufacturers in China got these pans made, sent over, like, I think on my initial order was at like 500, um, built a website. I didn't know how to build an e-commerce website or anything like that. This was all brand new to me, but I just quickly learned and just quickly did it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a thing. I don't, I don't sit still on things for too long. Like, I'm literally, I act quite quickly. Like, I'm not a big, I, I prefer people to, rather than talking about things, I prefer, to, like, do things, then people can talk about it. I think but, that's real, a strong trait of founders, though, yeah. particularly. And I think, it's you know I always think we're the we're the type of people to create businesses, mm. but I I even know with myself now, and I've got some uh, a guy Patrick who's the MD of Excite and helps run mm. it from an operations point of view. I know I'm very good at starting things, yeah, but probably like twelve months on, I'm I, apart from I can build brand and yeah. I can I, then I, my execution starts to drop. Okay, and I've yeah. started to realize that's the Just time like I need me. to bring people on and like yeah. okay, I've made this cool thing. Now what? <laughs> that's, yeah, literally same as me. But I think that's good though. Yeah. Like that's where you want to be. You want to have someone else who can like run it after a while and like be better than you at it basically. Yeah. And innovate. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is there's obviously a lot of fun being an entrepreneur mm. and you get a lot from it in life. Yeah. I seen a photo of you on your Instagram outside Downing Street yeah. for the startups. The moments like these talk me through yeah. what they do for you as a founder and how they, they motivate you really and tell me about that experience. Yeah, no, that was great. So I entered a competition, I think a couple of years ago, just the Great British Entrepreneur. Um, and it was basically all the finalists and winners of that. I was, I was just a finalist. I didn't win it. Um, they got invited to Downing street. Oh wow! So yeah, it was, it was really surreal. I remember the email coming through, it actually came through to my marketing director. Um, she forwarded it on to me. I thought it, I thought it was fake at first, but yeah, no, it was, it was, it was legit. Um, <laughs> That's cool. so I went, went to Downing street and yeah, I think those moments, cause it's, I'm never really satisfied so I don't know about you, but I'm always like, you know, I achieve one thing, then it's like, right, we need to get here. We need to get mm -hmm. here. Like, you're never really satisfied. Um, but then when you do things like that, you do realize, wow, I've come quite far, you know, like I wouldn't expect to be invited to number 10 Downing Street um, to meet the prime minister and stuff. So it is, they are nice. Um, like I think in those moments you do sit back and you realize, wow, I have, I have come quite far here. How do you sort of manage in it, like personally, I guess as well, but I'm, I always think I fall fail of this problem as well of like, I never celebrate the successes much, mm. even with the team as such. They're like, yeah. oh, we've got this new list in. And I'm like, great. So, <laughs> yeah. but then really, you should really celebrate those <laughs> things. But as a founder, you almost become numb to them, I, do. I think. It's strange. Yeah. I mean, it's an obsession with growth. But you're like, it's like, yeah, the team like almost want to celebrate things. And I'm like, What's next? What's next? Mm. Like, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite bad sometimes, I think, because it's just, comp well, I'm completely obsessed with growth. Um, so, you, but they, yeah, you should celebrate the small wins, I think, a bit more. Um, I mean, do you have anything 
um, you know, I know you're really into health and fitness. You're off to a fitness class after this. I need to see what you think of this excite as well before your fitness yeah. class. But what um, do you have any sort of things you do that you would say help you as an entrepreneur? Particularly, and then you're aware you're doing them because they help. Yeah, you. routine for me is extremely important. I've learned, I've learned that over only only the last couple of years as well. Like having a solid routine for me has been like absolutely everything. It reduces my stress at work, makes me a better person. So like, I get up in the morning at the same time. Um, I pretty much wear the same things every day. Just my training gear. Um, I go to the gym uh, really early in the morning. Do a really good workout go from have a coffee then go to the go to work and that that route just that simple routine has done everything for me really? like i look forward to it every day and if i don't have that routine if that gets disrupted like everything becomes worse in the day it's interesting so isn't just it? like having a solid routine for me has really helped me um and you know exercise has been huge um i've got a really good partner as well i think finding a partner if you have someone who's good does help so much someone who you can like who can give you honest feedback, you can talk to about your issues you're having, who actually cares. That's really helpful. And get and getting a dog. <laughs> yeah, no, it's lockdown dog or <laughs> getting a lockdown dog. Is honestly, it, yeah. right, that's another good one. What did you get? A little cockapoo. Oh, lovely. I live in I live Cute. in Fulham and have a cockapoo. What what a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Fear ticks the box there. Ticks the box. But no, it's great having you on. I think um, you know, it's insightful to learn more about what you've done with Pan Ice. I've seen it around, I'm definitely gonna try one now and see what it's all about. But thanks for coming on, mate. Well, and um, where can people find your stuff is it what's your website and things uh so yeah it's www.pan-n-ice.co.uk amazing and there you've got our locations and then all the diy kits and stuff no oh, amazing yeah well thank you man wish you all the success thank you very much cheers <laughs>